Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to NET 304. Um, my name is Gavin McCullough. I'm a system development engineer in Red 53. Uh, I've been in Amazon about 10 years, and uh, during the time I've worked in Amazon's internal load balancing and DNS uh, infrastructure, and then later in Red 53, the public DNS, the resolver, and various products, um, and most recently an application recovery controller. Um, with me is Jeff Damick, who is has been in Amazon for what about four and a half years, and is uh, he's the lead developer of Red 53 Resolver. So if you've used Resolver endpoints, query logging, that kind of stuff, Jeff is uh, the lead Resolver for that, or lead, excuse me, developer for that. So um, the purpose of this talk today is kind of catch you up on the last year to 18 months of features that Route 53 has built and give you an idea of how to use them and what's available now. Um, so for, I'm gonna start, we're gonna start with resolver stuff and then talk a little bit about DNSSEC and application recovery controller. And because Jeff, Jeff's the lead on resolver, he's gonna start us off. Thanks, Kevin. So as Gavin mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the features we've launched over the last year and a half for Resolver. But before we get, before we get started, I wanna do a quick refresher of what Route 53 Resolver is. And so Route 53 Resolver, you may see it referred to as Amazon provided DNS or VPC plus two Resolver, but all of those are the same. They're all Route 53 Resolver. And about a, a couple years ago we launched uh, inbound and outbound resolver endpoints. And so inbound resolver endpoints allow you to send DNS queries from on-premises, uh, uh, from recursive resolvers on-premises over a VPN or direct connect connection to uh, an inbound resolver endpoint. And then it'll resolve just like it does for resources within your VPC. And for outbound resolver endpoints, likewise, it'll be able to direct those queries from your VPC Route 53, Route 53 Resolver back to on-premises to a DNS server you may be running on-premises. And so within your VPC, Route 53 Resolver handles the recursive DNS queries, as you can see in the diagram, for all of your resources, your instances, your lambdas, et cetera, recursing out to public authoritative name servers or private hosted zones or to outbound endpoints as we discussed. And so the first feature I wanna talk about that we launched fairly recently is related to reverse records. And so reverse record lookups or, better, or PTR queries, if you have an Active Directory server potentially running on-premises, you may wanna direct these queries to that Active Directory server. And so previously, you had to create several rules to direct those queries. So if we look in the diagram here, if you have lots of VPCs and you are wanting to direct those queries to on-premises, you had to create rules for each of the CIDR blocks for those VPCs, and if you have peering or transit gateway connections between the VPCs, or you add more CIDR blocks, it becomes unwieldy. It's hard to manage all of those forwarding rules. And so what we've done is we created the ability to toggle on and off Route 53 Resolver's default uh, auto-defined rules for this. So by default, Route 53 Resolver will resolve all of these um, reverse record lookups, the PTR queries, but you can now toggle that off and simply create a, a dot rule to forward all of those queries back to on-premises to your Active Directory server. So now you don't have to manage all of the forwarding rules, et cetera. And so another feature launched very recently is, is for IPv6. And so if you have an IPv6, if you have a hybrid stack, or if you have uh, IPv6 only subnets, and you wanna be able to query Route 53 Resolver, there's the IPv4 address, which is the 169.254, 169.253 address for IPv4, but now there's an IPv6 address. And keep in mind, this is in Nitro only. And Further for your IPv6 only subnets, if you want to be able to talk to IPv4 resources, now you can enable DNS64 on the IP on the subnets that are hosting your IPv6 resources, and they can talk to those resources. So if you enable DNS64, 
Now when you query and there's no, if there's no quad A record for those resources, one will be synthesized, it'll be generated, and there'll be a, a quad A record for those. And then once your, your instance tries to connect to that, it'll utilize the NAT64, and that will enable the connection from IPv6 to IPv4 to your IPv4 resource. So now you can seamlessly talk between the two. And another feature we launched a little over a year ago is resolver query logging. And so resolver query logging has a few different use cases. Uh, you can use it for compliance purposes, you can do auditing, you can collect all of the query logs within your VPC, and you can run analytics on it, you can send it out to third party uh, analyzers and, and gain insights into that, or you could use it for debugging purposes if you want to figure out which instances are querying a particular record, or if you're seeing lots of serve fails or unexpected NX domains, this sort of thing, you can narrow it down using resolver query logs. You can even use it for threat detection. So if you see uh, uh, queries to malicious websites and you want to take action on those, you can, you can gain insight from resolver query logs, and we'll take a look at that. And so putting it into the context of the Route 53 resolver architecture, you can see how the, the queries flow from Route 53 resolver out to uh, the various public authoritatives or uh, private hosted zones, and then the responses and other metadata is sent to resolver query logging, which then you can direct to one of the outlets you choose. So if you choose to send them to S3 or CloudWatch, or Kinesis Data Firehose, you can choose where you want to send those to, so you can run analytics on it. And so to take a look at a sample of the resolver query log, this is the JSON that you would see, for example, in CloudWatch. You can see the information about the query name, which is damic.com, the query type, an A record, uh, the response, the IP address that came back, and then the instance that made the query. And you can couple this with con uh, CloudWatch Contributor Insights, and there are several sample rules that you can use to generate uh, various analytics, and you can uh, create dashboards, and we'll take a look at it in a second, so that you can track query types that are queried, uh, res result codes that are coming back, and these sorts of things. So let's walk through setting up a query log. So in this case, we're gonna send it off to CloudWatch, so log, CloudWatch log group here that I've specified. And then we'll attach that to the VPC that we're gonna want to collect our query logs for. So we'll go ahead and create that. Create the, and once we've created the resolver query logs, we'll wait, and then once it's attached to the active on that VPC, the query logs will start flowing into your, cloud, your outlet of choice. In this case, I'm sending off to CloudWatch. So let's take a look at what happens. So once we're on an instance within the VPC, let's say we're gonna query for Amazon.com. You can see the IP addresses that come back, the A records. So in CloudWatch, we see the same information. We see the IP addresses that are there, the A records that are available, and then the result code, the instance that queried it, the account information, other, lots of other metadata you can use to analyze. And then looking at a negative, negative case, in this case, we're digging for test.amazonaws.com. And this doesn't exist, so it's gonna return an NX domain. And so you can see similar information in the query logs. You can see the result code is an NX domain and the instance that queried it. So maybe if you see lots of NX domains, you may wanna be tracking that. And so getting back to the contributor insights, if you take those, some of those sample queries, so sample rules that are available, and generate them into a dashboard, you can really gain a view of what's going on within your VPC. So in this case, you can see a lot of the, the highest queried domains that are available. You can then track it down if you wanna gain and say which, which instances are doing this and the result codes that are coming back. So we see a whole bunch of serve fails in this case. So we wanna say which is the domain that's generating the most serve fails. And so in this case, I created one for this test, uh, failuremodes.damic.com, which is generating serve fails for all my instances. And so you can see that that's the top domain. And you can go further with these samples. You can really dig in and see which instances are seeing the most, and, and you can use your imagination to really go wild with these. And so the next feature I wanna talk about that launched earlier this year is DNS Firewall. 
And so DNS firewall has a few different potential use cases too. You can use it to protect against exfiltration. So maybe there is a malicious instance within your VPC if, if it's compromised or other and it's sending off, trying to send data off using DNS, you can restrict it, you could block it using the DNS firewall. So you could prevent access to these unwanted sites or botnets or malware, other sites like that. And you can even go as far as creating a walled garden so you can generate, uh, you can restrict all the access to only the allowed sites that you, you've deemed for your, your resources within your VPC. So some of the features for DNS firewall, so you can deny access, like we talked about. You can, there are a few different ways you can deny access. You can send back an, a no, no data or an X domain, or if it's a C name, you can redirect it to some other, uh, some other answer. And then for uh, managed domain list, there are a few different options. There's malware, botnets, and others. And so, and then you can gain insight into these. They'll get mixed into your query logs where you can uh, gain further information. We'll see a sample of that in just a second. And so putting this in the context of the Route 53 resolver architecture, you can see where DNS firewall fits in. So as those queries, before they go off to public authoritatives or private hosted zones or an outbound endpoint, they're gonna go through the DNS firewall and that's where your policies can be applied. And you can see that they're also sending off metadata information about the responses to query logging and then you can see how that's mixed into the, the query logs and we'll take a look at that in a second. So at a high level, DNS firewall provides rule groups that you then add domains to that you want to set for your, uh, an action that you want to take on those domains that are matched. And then you can associate those with the VPCs and you can use AWS Firewall Manager to manage those across many di different VPCs if you want to make it a little easier to, to manage. And coupling DNS firewall with Amazon Guard Duty or Amazon Detective, you can gain insights into suspicious activity within your VPCs uh, and other findings that Guard Duty has, and then you can decide the action you want to take based on those findings. If you see that they're potentially going off to malicious sites, you could take action to block certain domains that you want within your, your VPC. So now we'll take a look at setting up a, a DNS firewall. So in this case, we're going to create a rule group. Next, and then in this, the first, we're gonna add a rule to our rule group. And for our first rule, we're gonna add example.com as the domain, and then we're gonna decide the action that we're gonna take, and the action is gonna be an NX domain we're gonna send back. So any queries there for example.com, instead of getting back the normal A record answer that it gives, it's gonna give back an NX domain. So we'll go ahead and add that rule to our rule group, and do next. And so now we've got a rule rule group with one rule within it, and we're gonna go ahead and just create this rule group. And it's not specified which VPC it's associated to yet, so we've created the rule group with rules in it, and now we need to associate it to which VPCs so it'll become active. And so now we're gonna associate it to whichever VPCs we want to enact this, these DNS firewall on. So then once it's active on the VPC, those will be enforced. And if you want to add more rules to your rule group, you can go back and add more. In this case, we're going to add another one for cname.damic.com. And since this is a CNAME, we're going to go ahead and, and redirect. We're going to give back a different answer. We're going to override the answer, and we're going to override it to be local.damic.com. So that'll, instead of the normal answer that it's giving for that record, it'll now give back local.damic.com and chase that one, that CNAME. So we'll go ahead and add that rule to our rule group, and let's see what happens. So digging within an instance within the VPC, we're gonna dig for that example.com, and we see we get back an NX domain, just as we expected. But now, within our resolver query logs, we see extra metadata about the firewall. We can see the rule group that matched it, the domain list that was used to match it, and then the action that was decided. So we really gain insight into how the firewall is deciding what action to take based on the matches that it made. And you can, you can see, just as before, you can see the instance that made those, that query and the answer. Okay. Next, this example 
we're digging against a resolver inbound endpoint. So as I talked about for earlier, the resolver inbound endpoints, they act just like instances within your VPC. They'll be, uh, they'll be subject to the same policies that you set up for the DNS firewall for Route 53 resolver. It'll, it'll all be the same. So we're digging against this inbound endpoint for cname.damic.com, and in this case, we got back local.damic.com, and then it chased the cname and returned 127.001 in this, this example. If we look at the query logs, we can see that now it shows, instead of the instance ID, we can see the resolver inbound endpoint that was used for the query. So this is useful if you want to track this across your resolver inbound endpoints and see which ones are, are getting uh, serve fails or being blocked or, or this sort of thing. And again, you see the DNS firewall and from metadata here as well, the rule group that was matched, the rule, and then the action that was decided to take. So going back to our Contributor Insights dashboard, I've taken some of the samples for DNS Firewall and I've added them to this dashboard so that we can see a little bit about what's going on within our VPC. So in this case, we see the blocked domains, which are what we'd expect. We see uh, example.com and we see the cname.damic.com. Those are the, in the number of blocks. But maybe we want to track it down and we want to see, well, which resolver inbound endpoints are seeing the most blocks, and so we can add information. In this one, in this case, I just added resolver inbound endpoints, and we can see which exact inbound endpoint is seeing the most blocks. And you can dig in further, and you can set up your own examples and really uh, narrow down which, which instances or which inbound endpoints are, are getting blocked. Okay. And with that, I will turn it over to Gavin, who will walk you through Route 53 and DNSSEC. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, uh, quick show of hands if you wouldn't mind. How many of you are your DN the DNS expert in your company or in your, uh, even in your house? Okay, fair few. And how many of you are the DNS sec expert or feel like you really understand DNS sec? Smaller number of hands, okay. That's fairly common. So, because we're gonna talk about DNSSEC now, I'm gonna start off by trying to explain in a bit of detail what DNSSEC is and what it does. Uh, so at least you come away with that here. Um, okay, so let's move on. So, um, first thing to understand is what problem does DNSSEC solve? Um, the, the SEC is kind of a clue, obviously. There's a degree of it is the security extension for DNS. Um, so, there's two kind of use cases fundamentally. Uh, when you're talking to a web service from a host, whether it's on, at home or in a VPC or whatever, you want to be able to connect to the right IP address, and you want to know that when you make a DNS lookup for a service that you're going to connect to, you need to know that the IP address that's coming back is actually authentic. And it turns out, I'll show in a minute, uh, traditional DNS didn't really offer that guarantee in any way. So DNSSEC is about making sure that when people make DNS lookups, they get the right answers back. Um, from the purpose, from the other side of that conversation, if you are the owner of a web service, you want to be able to make sure that your clients can get your answers uh, and not some kind of forgery in the middle or something. And so, uh, again, this is what DNSSEC is for. From the, from the client side, you want to be able to validate. From the service side, you want to be able to sign answers so that the clients can validate. And the most common use case for this is compliance requirements these days. Um, uh, the, N the US NIST has requirements for this. If you're looking for things like uh, FedRAMP compliance, you'll probably be asked to deploy DNSSEC. So that's the, the most common use case. Um, an important kind of thing to understand with DNSSEC, people tend to think of it as an anal analogous to TLS or SSL for web transactions, and that's not exactly true. Um, DNSSEC only provides that authenticity of answers. It doesn't encrypt anything in transit. So the queries are still readable on the wire. There's no privacy aspect to DNSSEC. There is a, a second extension to DNS, or well, a second and a third even, um, called DOH and DOT, which you might be familiar with, and those add encryption. But they, they're sort of complementary to DNSSEC. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into what DNSSEC is and how it works. So we have this picture before, roughly speaking, Jeff showed, where you have 
in, in a VPC, typically, your client will query the Route 53 resolver, and it can forward queries to a bunch of different targets. There's private DNS, there's the VPC zone DNS, and then there's the public DNS authorities. And the first two are within the, v, within the EC2 network and are very secure, so we don't worry particularly about that. But the public DNS authorities are really, we're talking over the internet, and, and these are not trusted paths. So it's hard to assume when a UDP packet comes back that it definitely came from the people you think it did. So let's simplify this picture and just show what it is that we're really talking about here. Client queries the resolver, and now the resolver needs to be able to, the, the, the path between the resolver and public DNS is potentially untrusted, and we need to be careful and authenticate the answers. And really, this isn't a Route 53 issue per se. It is all on the, all of the internet has this pattern of client querying resolver and the resolver querying over the internet. Okay, so let's look in a little bit more detail. You probably are aware of this if you're the DNS expert in your company. Uh, a client querying a resolver will walk down the DNS tree, get, getting more and more specific toward the name that it wants. So the client queries in this example for www.gavinmc.com. So we see the query go to the resolver, and the resolver will start making queries. Assume it has no cache, nothing in cache for the minute, it will query the root, and then it will query the com name servers and the gavinmc.com name servers, asking the same question over and over, but gradually working its way down the tree. And then finally the resolver gets an answer and it can return it to the client. So let's look a little bit more detail at what's happening there. So again, the client queries the resolver, the resolver queries the root, and here's the answer that comes back. So the question was for the full name, www.gavinmc.com, and the response is a referral. So this is the root name server on the internet saying, I don't handle com, I delegate it to these other name servers. You need to go and ask them about anything under com. So the resolver queries com's name servers from that list, and it finds another referral to say, well, gavinmc.com, I've delegated off to these other four name servers. They happen to be Route 53 name servers in this example. And so we go and query one of the four Route 53 name servers. And now we get an answer back, right? And finally, the resolver answers to the client. Now there's caching and stuff. We don't necessarily make all these queries every time, but that is the process of recursive resolution. And the thing that we need to understand is that when the resolver is querying each of these name servers, it may be over an unsecure channel, and it may not be able to verify that, there, or there is no way in traditional DNS to verify that it really got an answer back that was, that was the true one from the authority. So restating a little bit, DNS, traditional DNS, uh, as invented in the 1980s, is unencrypted and unauthenticated. Unencrypted meaning if there is somebody sitting on the wire somewhere in the path, they can absolutely read the query. And DNSSEC doesn't really change that. A couple of other standards that can in the future. And it's also unauthenticated, and this is the DNSSEC part. So the DNSSEC, if, you, if we say that there is somebody who could be on the path who could read the query, well, they could also answer, right? They could forge a query back and probably win the race uh, from the, the real authority answering. So DNSSEC adds cryptographic signatures to all the answers, that the, uh, the, the answers in DNS in order that the resolver can actually verify the authenticity. So let's look back at our model again. All those queries are in the clear and potentially forgeable across the internet. It doesn't actually happen that much in practice, uh, especially on like the AWS network is very secure, but it is something that people get concerned about. And so, so let's look at a few questions. How do the resolvers actually verify the answers are correct? So you have signatures in all these answers, and you have a set of keys. So every zone has, under DNSSEC, every zone will have a, every hosted zone will have a DNS key. And so there's a key pair, actually two, um, but I won't get too far into the details of that. There's a key pair, so you have a public and a private key. And the authority uses the private key to sign all the answers. And then it will publish the public key as a record that you can query. So you can query for DNS key and get back the public record or the public key for the zone. There's a second new, new record type that we add called a delegation signer. And what this is used for is for at those delegations I showed where root delegates to com or com delegates to gavinmc.com's name servers, what we're saying with the DS record is along with a delegation, 
here's a, here's a fingerprint of the key you should expect when you get there. So you establish trust at the root, and the root tells you what the key will look like when you get to calm. You can trust calm if he, if he has this key. And then that is worked all the way down so you can build this chain of trust. And then having established what the key is for a zone, all the answers you'll get will, be, will include these signatures. And once you know what the public key is, you can verify the signatures. This will become a little bit more obvious when I show it a bit more visually. Okay, so returning to that model, the client queried the resolver, the resolver queried the root. Resolvers know the IP addresses of the root. Every DNS resolver has as part of its base install the list of root name servers. And it also has the list or the DNS key for the root, which changes extremely rarely. So it makes a query to the root, and as before, we get a delegation back. But there's a difference. We get an extra record, which is this DS record. So previously we had the instruction, you should go to these name servers for com. Now we're adding in, when you get to those name servers for com, this is the key you should expect. And you can trust it if it looks like that. And I'm gonna sign, the root server will say, I'm gonna sign this record so you can trust that too. So that you can trust that this DS is honest. So we make our query against com. And the first query we make is for the DNS key. And so we ask com for its DNS key, and it responds, and we can use that DS record we got before to validate that this is truly the com name server answering, and this is the right key. And now we can make the second, the original, the usual query, and we get our referral to gavinmc.com. And now com will include a DS record to say, gavinmc.com is a signed zone, and you should expect the key to look like this. And again, Com will sign that answer to, allow, to, to make sure that nothing could be forged. Okay, and finally, we query GavinMC.com. Again, we're gonna make two queries instead of one. One for the key first to establish the chain of trust. And then finally, we make the old style query and we get back the answer, but with a signature this time. And so we've, wor we've worked out the keys all the way down. We know the key for GavinMC.com, the public key. And so we can not only look at this answer, we can use the signature and the key to say, okay, is this answer actually true? Is this the, the, the authentic answer? And the answer is, well, is yes in this case. Okay, so when we went to build this in Route 53, there were a few design tenets that we talk talked about. Um, DNSSEC is a relatively complicated extension to the protocol. I think you can probably agree even from me explaining it there. Um, and so one of the things that we said was we, we really gotta make this as safe and simple and easy to use as possible. If we were to say, to say well, customers should go and or SIG records in the zone, uh, that would be pretty painful. You'd have to learn a lot of complicated things. So obviously we don't do that. We made sure the signing was fully automatic, that the key management is largely automatic. Going on in that key stuff, there is a regular rotation of the, the key signing key stays static, but there's a zone signing key that is re rotated on a regular basis. All of that is automatic. You don't need to worry about it. And also, we talked about you know making sure that if you already use Route 53 features, all of them would just work. So you don't have to choose anything difficult. Um, if you use waiting or health checks or aliases or query logging, all of that stuff just works. So I'm gonna go through a few DNSSEC kind of standard tasks just to give you an idea of what it looks like to enable it and how to do it as a you know, best practice. So the first thing is you have a VPC, you're using Route 53 Resolver, how do you enable validation? So for all the signed, zone, signed domains on the internet, you want, to, you want to validate that they're correct. This is really very straightforward. Inside the Resolver, if you go into the Resolver console, there's a VPCs, link there, and you can see here that I have a VPC and that I have DNSSEC validation currently disabled. That's the default for now. And so I click on that and I can tick that box, set enable DNSSEC validation, that's it. So it switches to enabling, and from then on, when you make a query against Resolver, it will turn DNSSEC validation on for, your, uh, for all the queries that you make. So the second thing, supposing you're publishing a 
website or a web service and you want your clients to be able to do validation, you need to sign your zone. So the first step is to enable signing on the zone, and then the second step is to publish the DS record at the parent so that people expect the signatures. So we go into the Route 53 console. There's a tab here for DNSSEC signing, and it currently says not signing. We can click here, enable DNSSEC signing. There's a couple of short questions. Basically, we're going to, it's, it's asking us what key to use. We use Amazon's key management service for, the, for storing the key, which is very secure. So we give it a name, and we're going to choose to create a new key. If you wanted to do this a little more cheaply, if you had a lot of zones, you can reuse the same key over and over. In this case, I'll create a new one. And then I press Create KSK and enable signing. And so you can see it's switched to signing. So now um, we're, we're pretty much ready. The zone is now responding to DNS key queries and will respond with signatures when it's answering queries. And if you look in the KMS console here, you can see that a key has been created in my account as the customer. Uh, and this means that I have control, control over the credential. So in our model, what did that actually do? Let's just remind ourselves. So the query against gavinmc.com for a DNS key will now succeed and we'll get answers. And then if we query for www.gavinmc.com, we're gonna get not only the answer, but the signatures. But we don't yet have a DS record at the parent. Now, important steps, both enabling and disabling DNSSEC, are to wait a period after this. It is possible, probably fairly unlikely in the forward direction of enabling, but definitely possible in the reverse when you're disabling, it is possible to uh, enable signing um, and for a resolver to uh, have cached unsigned records in their cache, and then they start seeing, if you enable the DS too quickly, they will start seeing, they will have in cache a signed DS or a DS record saying, you know, expect signatures, but there's still an unsigned record in their cache. And you can see failures doing that. So after enabling signing, you want to wait for a while. Typically up to two days, it's probably on the high side, but leave it for a period to allow records, unsigned records to, to escape from cache. And now we need to insert the delegation signer. So if we go back into the Route for Three hosted zone console, you can see here a few information to update the DS record. And there's obviously, particularly for second level domain, you may be talking about a different DNS provider here, but for Route 53 registrar, you have three fields that matter. The key signing key type, a signing algorithm, and a key. If you're using a different registrar, you may find that there are other fields that they ask for. All of those are displayed there if you need them. And this is the Route 53 registrar console. Uh, I'm just using Route 53 registrar. And you can see over here, DNSSEC status is disabled, so I'll manage the keys, and I just fill in those three fields. And so what we're doing here is publishing that DS record at the comm zone. So you can see it listed there as enabled now. So now, if we make a query to comm from the resolver, not only will we get the, the, dele the delegation, but we will get a DS record. And this is the moment when DNSSEC really goes into force, because resolvers, when they see a DS, will start to expect a signature. And if there isn't a signature there, they will return serve fail to clients. OK, last task that is worth knowing about. There are a bunch of situations where you may need to disable DNSSEC. And it's important to know in what order and how to do it. So. If you remove the, you first need to remove the delegation signer at the parent. Like a lot of rollback situations, you go in reverse. So the first thing we do is we remove the delegation signer record at com, and we wait for a period, and then we disable signing on the zone. So we go back into the registrar console, manage keys, and we'll just delete that key there. And now we have to wait. So there will be a lot of resolvers on the internet, potentially, that have cached that DS record. They're expecting signatures from the zone, from the name servers when they, when they follow the delegation. And the comm zone, as an example, sets a cache time, a TTL, of one day. So you really do need to wait a significant time after removing the DS before disabling signing in the zone itself. 
So after we've waited this time, go back into the Route 53 console, disable DNSSEC signing, and you will see it go off. So a question that comes up a lot with customers is, well, you know, should I be using DNSSEC? Is this an important thing for me to, to enable? And DNSSEC is a little bit sort of like marmite. It causes some division among the community. But um, the way I would typically think about this is, if you want to learn an experiment, especially if you've got like a personal zone or whatever, absolutely, like try it out, learn from it, all, all good. If you have specific reasons like compliance requirements or uh, Im important like business reasons to do it, absolutely, yes, that's what we've built it for. Um, if you're running a production website and you don't really need DNSSEC, I would think carefully about the trade-offs. Um, it's still, I mean, we've done our best to make the DNS provider itself really, really transparent and all, everything automatic as far as we can. But because you end up doing things with other providers and stuff, there can be some complexity there and it can be easy to get wrong. So. Um, if, if you really need it, use it. If you don't, I would think carefully. One of the other things to take account of is we're still pretty early in the adoption phase of DNSSEC. I think um, something in the region of 20 to 30% of, of uh, resolver queries are actually validating at this point. So it's kind of, there, is, there are some security benefits, but it's still kind of limited. Not that many zones are signed, so you may want to wait for over time for a little bit more adoption before you do it on something really critical. And always, as I say, beware of this caching. Whenever you're making changes to DNSSEC config, think about the resolvers and what their cache might contain. A couple of quick best practices if you're doing it in an important in a production situation. I mentioned that the key is stored in your account. And that's kind of part of the compliance story to be able to say, you as a customer are in control of this credential. But one of the downsides of that is um, you could potentially, you, you know, the new guy in your team will go in potentially and disable that key or delete it or re revoke Route 53's ability to read from it. And that would cause us, after a period, to be unable to sign the zone. So we publish an alarm, or excuse me, a metric rather, that shows signing errors. And that is generally zero. But in that one case where maybe you've revoked the, our access to the key, we will start publishing errors and you can alarm on it. So you would get a warning quickly. On an important production zone, I would recommend doing that. If you need to rotate the key signing key, there is a uh, somewhat complicated kind of ceremony that has to go on with that where you have to update the registrar details as well, or update the DS at the registrar. I would recommend always doing that a couple of times on a non-production zone first. It's doable, but it's a little bit complicated and you wanna know, you wanna be prepared for it. There's a blog there that I, uh, you can see referenced there that will show you exactly what the steps are. If you're migrating onto Route 53 or for some reason off Route 53, one important thing to, think, to remember is you need to disable DNSSEC while doing that. Route 53, like a lot of the, the big providers, is an online DNSSEC signing service. And the result is that it isn't really possible right now to have multiple providers at the same time. So you really, the, be the best way to do a transition is to turn off DNSSEC, add, add the second provider, uh, and, and, and then remove the first provider, and then re-enable DNSSEC. Okay, so the last topic I want to talk about today is application recovery controller. And so this was launched last August, if I recall correctly. Um, and it's an interesting product. Um, and you might want to give me five minutes to just kind of set the scene for why you would use this product. So we have a lot of customers who come to us uh, who want to build extremely reliable applications. And so for example, we're talking about kind of uh, trading systems or uh, emergency systems or banks who are very, very sensitive to even the slightest interruption. So they may have a goal of like less than five minutes interruption per year, which is pretty hard bar to meet actually. And in practice, when you try to shrink the window of interruption in a year, what you end up looking at is, well, I can either reduce the number of failures per year or how long the failures last in order to, in, in, in order to reduce the total number of minutes of failure. So you have an availability that's kind of proportional to the mean time before failures 
or mean time, excuse me, between failures multiplied by the mean time to recovery from the failure. And so essentially you can either try to prevent failures as hard as you can, or you can try to recover quickly from failures when they happen. And you kind of end up needing to do both. And so there's an area of academic interest called recovery-oriented computing, which is about the second piece in particular of how do we set up systems so that they can recover very quickly from failures. And if, you haven't, if you're interested in this area of building really highly reliable applications, I would recommend having a look at this paper at some point if you haven't before. It's had a fairly profound effect in Amazon on how we build systems, just the, the kind of ideas in it. And two of the key ideas are that failures are inevitable, and so you need to plan and design for them. And you're not going to build any system that is 100% always available. There will always be some component failing or whatever, and you need to be able to handle that. And so you need means to recover. And so the kind of key system ideas, or two of them in, in the paper are that rather than building components that have any kind of single point of failure, everything needs to be built as far as possible with redundant isolated units. And if you're used to looking at something like RAID disk arrays, this is fairly familiar territory. But this is m probably more extreme. Like typically we're not talking about uh, small fleets of hosts, multiple fleets of hosts so that you can deploy them separately. And then the other thing that's needed is when you have, so let, let's say you build three replicas of your application in different data centers to have great redundancy. Uh, one of the things that you need is, let's suppose you start deploying in the first one and it's a bad deployment for some reason, something goes wrong. You wanna be able to take that replica out and keep the other two going. And that's your recovery mechanism. You need that mechanism by which you will do that. So there needs some, some very practiced, quick mechanism to detect one of the replicas is bad and take it out. So again, we're gonna build applica our application out of redundant replicas. We're gonna make sure that pretty much anything we could break, we have more than one of so we can recover. We gotta make sure that all of the replicas are ready at all times. If you think about having, especially an active standby situation, there's always that question of, is the standby perfectly ready for this? Because it's not act taking traffic right now, so ugh, will that work? And the, the third thing is making sure that you have minimized shared fate. So the, the place that you will see this in AWS most obviously is availability zones. They are multiple data centers miles apart from each other on different floodplains with different power and operated separately at separate times by AWS in order to give them the, the least shared fate possible. And so if you build your applications, your replicas on availability zones, you can give them already a lot of, minim a, a, a minimize the shared fate of the infrastructure they're on. And then you need to think about, well, if I have these three replicas, I should deploy to one of them at a time. Leave a gap in time, and then move on to the second one, leave a gap, and then move on to the third one. So you're really operating them as independent, or as independent as possible. And again, when, when a replica fails, which it inevitably will at some point, have that mechanism to quickly recover. So I'll give you a couple of examples of architectures like this. The Route 53 resolver looks like this. I've kind of shown it before, Jeff has two. Instances query a VPC, and this Route 53 resolver component is important. It's not one box. There's a fleet of them. But one of the things that we worked out over time was we would have deployments going on or something would happen, and it, we, we could run into a problem, and having a single fleet there was really not enough for us. Even though there's one in each availability zone, we decided that we really needed better redundancy there. So even within one zone, if we had a problem, we could still recover. And we changed the architecture to look more like this. And I'm showing two what we call cells that you can see in the top AZ there, there's A1 and A2. And so these are independent fleets deployed at different times in order that if A1 were to fail, A2 is there, has enough capacity to take the full load and all will be well. In practice, there aren't two cells in the big AZs, there's quite, quite a few more than that. But this is the kind of idea, is making sure that we have redundancy in our components like this. Uh, possibly a more familiar example would be a 3AZ web service. 
If you've built in AWS, this will be fairly old, uh, old news, but we're gonna use three auto scaling groups separately in each AZ. We're gonna deploy them separately. We'll probably have one database. It's very hard to minimize shared fate with a database because if a customer makes a transaction through zone A, he's gonna to expect to immediately see it in zone C. So you really need one common data store. That's a place where minimizing shared fate's probably not really 100% uh, doable, but we're gonna minimize as far as we can. Let's have three separate NLBs, and we will hook them together with DNS. So a query, a customer will come in, use the one DNS name, and Route 53 will return three IPs or one IP at a time directing customers to each of the zones. And we'll probably have health checks here so that if one of those NLBs goes on wrong in an obvious way, it will just drop out. But the question, so this is an active-active setup, and the question that's gonna come up here is, okay, we've built this, what reco recovery mechanism are we going to use? Say AZB is failing. How do we make sure only one AZ is removed at a time? If for example, one of our staff removes availability zone B and forgets about it. Could somebody else come along later and try and remove AZC? We probably didn't build enough capacity to run this service on one AZ. It probably needs two. Um, so we need some kind of guardrail there. So a third example. We sometimes come across customers who have regulatory requirements to say things like, well, you must have a disaster recovery plan where at least 500 miles away, you will have a second full replica of your service. And availability zones are kind of 10 miles away, so there's a, you can't really use them in that kind of disaster recovery scenario. So you, they will often have a standby of the entire application running in US, West, US East 1 and US West 2, for example. So we see that here. That looks very like the architecture from before. We have Route 53, a hosted zone, queries come from customers, and then they connect to the NLBs. And then they will have a completely separate replica in US West 2. Again, it's multi-zone. It very deliberately looks exactly like the one in US East 1. And we probably have like asynchronous replication, so the database in US West 2 is, is getting the, the updates fed from US East 1, but with some lag. It's probably a few seconds or maybe a minute behind. And so this is an active standby setup, and it would allow in a catastrophic failure in US East 1 for US West 2 to take over. And this is the kind of thing those regulators are looking for. So again, what recovery mechanism would we use to fail over here? And how do we know the standby is ready for production? Imagine over time, this is running for a few years, more traffic shows up, we scale up US East 1, we scale up the NLBs, we uh, re in, it bump the size of the, of the database to take more traffic. Are we gonna remember to match that all the time in US West 2? Maybe, but best not leave it to chance. And the other thing is how do we make sure that we couldn't make a mistake? We, we would never want in this situation to have two regions in service at the same time. So we need guardrails there to make sure that doesn't happen. So that was the uh, long introduction to why Application Recovery Controller exists and what, what we've built it for, is to answer these three questions. How do we know we're ready to take a replica out? How will we do it? What recovery mechanism do we use? And how do we make sure the failover is safe? What kind of guardrails do we need? So let's go through the first question about being ready for failure. So we have a, a service called readiness checks under application recovery controller. And basically it's a set of comparison, a, a, an auditing and comparison system to make sure that you're always ready for failure. So let me go back to this application. The first set of readiness checks we would use here are auto scaling group readiness checks. We wanna make sure that, for example, the min size and max size of the auto scaling groups in US West 2 match up with US East 1. Also, the types of instances we're using. If we've grown the instances in US East 1, we want to make sure that the standby has the same. We have NLB readiness checks. We can make sure that the provision capacity in US West 2 is the same as in US East 1. If US West 2 is cold, which it likely is, you probably need to actually set provisioned capacity to make sure that it will be ready when the time comes and a boatload of traffic suddenly shows up. 
We, can also, we, we also have readiness checks for Amazon Aurora. So like I said, if you were to bump the, the, the size of the database in US East 1, you want to remember to do it in US West 2. And at all times, make sure that we're going to be ready for this failover. And you can probably think of for your own application some kind of custom checks that you would make, like not every application is the same. So we have a feature in Amazon uh, for monitoring Amazon CloudWatch alarms here too. So you can create a custom alarm based on monitoring a CloudWatch alarm so that your readiness will fail if whatever the logic you're building into that metric uh, goes into alarm. So the second question that we wanted ARC to solve was what recovery mechanism do we use? So keep in mind that we're talking about a catastrophic situation here. Um, for whatever reason, we're having to evacuate US East 1. And this is the story that the regulators are talking about. You know, We have like a natural disaster in US East 1. Things have to be able to fail over. In that situation, using the Route 53 control plane, a lot of AWS solutions architects will tell you that you don't want to depend on control planes in disaster. And so, what we, have, what we have built is routing controls. And this is a data plane, very highly available mechanism that integrates with Route 53 health checks. And it allows you, even in a disaster, to always be able to fail over. So it presents APIs to allow you to call for failover. And the API is spread across five AWS regions. The purpose of that is that we can tolerate major disasters and still be able to make that call to fail over. One of the other things that's, that, that, that's interesting with it is all of the changes are ordered. So if you imagine, like this is an API, you might build automation that would automatically take an AZ or a region out of service. But it can be hard to get those kinds of systems right. And you need something that will enforce that. Two copies of the automation can't both run, and one of them takes one region out and the other one takes the other region out. Or somehow they, they, they enable both regions to be in service at the same time. And so it, this enables the guardrails that I'll talk about in a minute. So looking back at this, rather than using the Route 53 control plane, we're using the ARC cluster and health checks. So this gives us these buttons. I'm gonna, I, I guess I would picture them. But we can make an API call to any of the five regions, and that will turn off East 1, and the traffic will shift. And again, with very, very high availability. Okay, so the last question we had was, how do we make sure failover is actually safe? So looking back, well, what we need is a set of rules. And for every customer, they're gonna be a little bit different, so they're configurable. So for example, if you're an active-active setup with maybe three AZs, you probably don't have enough capacity to run with one AZ. You wanna make sure there's a rule that says, never take out more than one. In an active standby situation, Typically, the worst case, oddly enough, is to take both, is, is to let both be in at the same time. That's not going to be good for customers. Um, you're not going to accept rights on the standby. So in that active-active model, let's say someone has taken out US East 1A, but the other two are enabled. Whoops. But we've set a safety rule that there must be two or more endpoints in service at all time, because that's what our capacity model needs. And so the ARC cluster, even within milliseconds of accepting taking out one AZ, will refuse the second AZ. So you can relax and run multiple copies of your automation and not worry that one of them is going to conflict with another. Um, there are a couple of related sessions. They happened yesterday. So uh, if you would like to talk with me afterwards, if you have any questions on it, uh, I've only given you a very kind of thin uh, introductory example, or introductory uh, idea of application recovery controller here, but if you would like to get more info, I can talk to you afterwards and we can set up an engagement. So we've briefly gone through a whole suite of the things that Route 53 has launched in the last 18 months or so. And one of the really exciting things about reInvent is talking to customers and actually hearing what they're doing with these things. So hopefully these new features have sparked ideas for you guys to use. Um, and any, anyone has any questions, Jeff and I will be around afterward. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>